Son of the Holy Spirit. In the Evergeti Nos, which is a collection of stories and sayings of various desert fathers and early patristic writings, one of the early stories in the first volume, which deals, of course, with repentance, is the story of the nun Taisia. Well, she wasn't a nun at this point. We call her because the young woman Taisia at this point. And she, in her early life, made a point of taking her inheritance and the monks who were nearby, she would offer hospitality and take care of people that they needed her to take care of and offer money and alms. And she was very gracious in this for many, many years. But at some point, she ran out of money. Instead of turning to God, she began to hang out with people that well, certainly weren't the monastics, people that were a little, you know, more ill repute as the prodigal today. And she eventually fell into harlotry herself, trying to make money, because these are the kind of people she was around all the time. Well, the monks eventually found out about this from the distant monastery, and of course were greatly distressed at the state of Taisia. And so they decided that they would send Abba John the Short to go visit her. But he goes to this place, and he knocks on the door, and he says he wants to see Taisia. Of course, the woman tells her, go away, monk. She didn't want anything to do with it. You, you are the ones that did this to her. She tries to blame them. And he says, no, I want to see her. And of course, the woman goes and asks Taisia. And Taisia knows that these monks live in an area, she says, where they can find precious pearls and things by the sea. And she thinks that she's going to get some great money from this venture, we will call it. And John the Short is invited in. He goes into her room, and he begins to weep and pray for her. And he looks at her and says, What is it that you have against Jesus, that you blame the state you're in on him? Of course, she's paralyzed by these words. What is it that you have against Jesus? Abba, why are you weeping? He says, he says because I see Satan playing on your face as we speak. Look at the state you have come to. She looks at him and says, but is there repentance? And he tells her there is always repentance for those who seek the Lord. She says, can I come with you? And he tells her, of course, but don't you need to settle your affairs here first? She says, no, I cannot do that, of course, because this might lead me into more temptation. She immediately leaves with him. And this is an amazing thing in itself. He marvels at it because she doesn't, he doesn't wait around, she doesn't wait around to repent, she repents then and on the spot decisively. She goes out with him, they walk as far away as they can at that night and they finally get to a place where they need to rest. He goes off in the distance, makes a place for her to sleep. In the middle of the night he, see, he begins to see this great light coming down from heaven upon where he had made the place for her to rest. He goes running over there, thinking something is going wrong, maybe robbers, anything is happening. And there he sees, of course, angels. He begins, he notices that she, she, is, she has passed away, she is reposed. He begins to pray for her, worrying about the state of her soul. Eventually, God reveals to him and says, the single hour of repentance which this woman offered was received more quickly than that of those who spent many years in repentance, because hers was more earnest than theirs. This is a great story. It gives us great hope, but it also should bring us perhaps to a little bit of trepidation as well. Our repentance needs to be decisive. Think about that story I've told you before about the story of Wolfman Tom, the Russian, who when the priest asked him, is your Repentance, decisive. If you is this, you know, do you, do you intend to turn back to your sins? He says, no, Father. With God's help, no. And he turns away from sin. When Jesus tells people to go and sin no more, this is indeed what Taisia did. Of course, with the assistance of this great Abba. This is not unlike the prodigal son. This man had everything. He lived in a good home, apparently. There was riches and wealth. Everything was given. Father is gracious, as we can see later in the story. But he decides that that's not enough. He wants his inheritance now. 
Now consider what that means. We don't get our inheritances typically until someone passes away. At least that's not the way it works in my family, and those most families I know. The inheritance I would receive would not make it very long for that many years. I'm not aware of this wealthy person in my family yet. But he is as if the father is dead. That is basically what he is saying. You're dead to me. I'm going away now. You're not alive. I'm taking my money now. I want to live that way now. And his father, allowing his free will, as God does with us, allows him to go away. And it says he goes into a far country. Now, this is a big thing for them. For us, it doesn't seem so amazing. We travel around the world all the time, the drop of a hat. For them, it was a really big deal. Obviously, there were no airplanes, there were no cars, there were no freeways. There was no restaurants on every corner and gas stations and places to stop. There were no hotels. The chances of getting robbed were great, abused very great. And of course, he had money, so it was even greater. So he was taking a chance. And he went far away. And of course, we have another indication that he was far away because he went there and there were swine. Typically in Israel, there were not a bit many swine. Very unclean animals, which they did not use. And the man goes off, and of course it says it wastes his life, and wastes his inheritance and riotous living with harlots. The worst kind of behavior he could. This is what he thought of his father. He took it away as if his father were dead. And even the memory of his father didn't mean much to him at this point. So what state does he find himself in? Hiring himself out to where he would even deign to eat what the pigs were eating. And this is a son of Abraham. This is a pretty low state he has gotten himself to, a place where no son of Abraham would have dared to go. But that's where he was. And that's when it says that he came to himself. What does this mean he came to himself? He realized once again what he had lost. He became to humility. He became to true self-knowledge and realized how far he way, away he was from the good state that he had begun in. So what was he to do? So that he came to a great revelation. I will return to my father. And that is our repentance. It is exactly like us. It is like Taisia. He turns around and moves back toward the father, begins to make that movement. We don't know how long it took him to make that trip back. It was a far country. So perhaps like Mary of Egypt, there were many temptations along the way. But he endured and continued his journey, continued his repentance. He had made that decision decisively and went toward his father. And when he gets a far distance away, it doesn't even indicate that the father can see him, as you say. The father from a distance, a very far off. The father knows he's coming and runs out to him. He makes the greater effort and runs to him, much as our Lord does with us. He grabs him, embraces him, is overjoyed that he's found his lost son, killed the fatted calf, put him in the robe, put a ring on his hand, sandals on his feet, takes care of him again. He is overjoyed to make merry that his son who was lost has been found and is dead is alive again. Because of his repentance, he turned back much as Taisia was accepted. The older son, of course, as we know in the story, doesn't like this very much. He didn't do all these bad things. He was a good boy the whole time. He was the Pharisee of last week. He did everything he was supposed to do. But he didn't want to accept the repentance of this man who had turned away. He wasn't acting as his father. All of us act like one of those two, some of the time and some a lot of the time. But the father noticed when he came running back, he didn't say, what have you done? Oh, look who it is. You've returned now wanting something. He didn't mock him. He embraced his repentance, his sincere repentance. Accepted that and tells the older boy to do so as well. I notice the older boy had everything with him the entire time. His gifts weren't taken away. He hadn't lost his inheritance. He still has that inheritance to gain. It doesn't say that the son who went off has that inheritance anymore. Oh, he's back and he has good things and a decent life again. But he doesn't have that to gain anymore. The great treasures, the great crowns, he gains the kingdom. And 
What could be greater? That is wonderful. But perhaps the older son potentially has a greater mansion to attain to yet, because he still is following the way. This has to be our repentance. It can't be, as we've said many times, that one that we wait for that's down the road, that comes tomorrow, that word that is truly, as St. Theophon the Recluse says, from the devil, because there is no tomorrow. We can't be assured of tomorrow. All we have is right now. All we have is this minute. And all of us at some point find ourselves feeding with swine, because that's exactly what sin is. It is feeding with swine. Our pride, our lust, our anger, all of it. Because that means if God is dead to us, and turning away, and we can live without him and take whatever gifts he's given us and use them the way we see fit, I think they won't be lost. But we all come to a point, God willing, where we realize that is foolishness. And hopefully all of us have a Abba John who comes to us and says, what is it that you have against Jesus? Perhaps it's someone in our lives, perhaps it's an event, perhaps it's an illness, perhaps it's some trauma. But something in our life is going to tell us, what is it you have against Jesus? And that's when you can say, is there repentance? And if your Lord will say, yes, there is. And you turn back decisively from that moment, don't wait. Don't wait to get everything right for that moment for repentance. It's never going to be right. That moment is right. Turn to God with all your heart, with all you have, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength, with everything that you have. Turn to God decisively. Return to your Father, be willing to be one of his hired servants. And that moment of repentance will be worth more than many lifetimes, certainly, of talking about it. We must be decisive and turn back to our Christ, who desires to give us that fatted calf, that paschal lamb of the kingdom. Amen. Amen.